Chapter Six of Celebrated Crimes, Volume Seven, Part One. Ali Pasha by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Ali had long cherished a violent passion for Zobeida, the wife of his son Veli Pasha. Having vainly attempted to gratify it after his son's departure and being indignantly repulsed, he had recourse to drugs and the unhappy Zobayda remained in ignorance of her misfortune until she found she was pregnant. Then, half avowals from her women compelled to obey the pasha from fear of death, mixed with confused memories of her own, revealed the whole terrible truth. Not knowing in her despair which way to turn, she wrote to Ali, entreating him to visit the harem. As head of his family, he had a right to enter, being supposed responsible for the conduct of his son's families, no lawgiver having hitherto contemplated the possibility of so disgraceful a crime. When he appeared, Zobayda flung herself at his feet, speechless with grief. Ali acknowledged his guilt, pleaded the violence of his passion, wept with his victim, and entreating her to control herself and keep silence, promised that all should be made right. Neither the prayers nor tears of Zobayda could induce him to give up the intention of effacing the traces of his first crime, by a second even more horrible. But the story was already whispered abroad, and Pacho Bey learned that all its details from the spies he kept in Yanina. Delighted at the prospect of avenging himself on the father, he hastened with his news to the son. Veli Pasha, furious, vowed vengeance, and demanded Pacho Bey's help, which was readily promised. But Ali had been warned, and was not a man to be taken unawares, Pacho Bey, whom Veli had just promoted to the office of sword-bearer, was attacked in broad daylight by six emissaries sent from Yanina. He obtained timely help, however, and five of the assassins, taken red-handed, were at once hung without ceremony in the marketplace. The sixth was the messenger whose arrival with the news had caused such dismay at Ali's banquet. As Ali reflected how the storm he had raised could best be laid, he was informed that the ruler of the marriage feast sent by Mustai, Pasha of Skodra, to receive the young bride who would reign in his harem, had just arrived in the plain of Yanina. He was Yusuf Bey of the Delres, an old enemy of Ali's, and had encamped with his escort of eight hundred warriors at the foot of Tomoros of Dodona. Dreading some treachery, he absolutely refused all entreaties to enter the town, and Ali, seeing that it was useless to insist and that his adversary for the present was safe, at once sent his granddaughter, the princess of Ali's, out to him. This matter disposed of, Ali was able to attend to his hideous family tragedy. He began by effecting the disappearance of the women whom he had been compelled to make his accomplices. They were simply sewn up in sacks by gypsies and thrown into the lake. This done, he himself led the executioners into a subterranean part of the castle, where they were beheaded by black mutes as a reward for their obedience. He then sent a doctor to Zobaide, who succeeded in causing a miscarriage, and who, his work done, was seized and strangled by the black mutes who had just beheaded the gypsies. Having thus got rid of all who could bear witness to his crimes, he wrote to Veli that he might now send for his wife and two of his children, hitherto detained as hostages, and that the innocence of Zobaida would confound a calumniator who had dared to assail him with such injurious suspicions. When this letter arrived, Pasho Bey, distrusting equally the treachery of the father and the weakness of the son, and content with having sown the seeds of dissension in his enemy's family, had sufficient wisdom to seek safety in flight. Ali, furious, vowed on hearing this, that his vengeance should overtake him even at the ends of the earth. Meanwhile, he fell back on Yusuf Bey of the Debres, whose escape when lately at Yanina still rankled in his mind. As Yusuf was dangerous both from character and influence, Ali feared to attack him openly and sought to assassinate him. This was not precisely easy, for, exposed to a thousand dangers of this kind, the nobles of that day were on their guard. Steel and poison were used up, and another way had to be sought. Ali found it. One of the many adventurers with whom Yanina was filled penetrated to the pasha's presence and offered to sell the secret of a powder, whereof three grains would suffice to kill a man with a terrible explosion. Explosive powder, in short. Ali heard with delight, but replied that he must see it in action before purchasing. 
In the dungeons of the castle by the lake, a poor monk of the Order of St. Basil was slowly dying for having boldly refused a sacrilegious simony proposed to him by Ali. He was a fit subject for the experiment and was successfully blown to pieces, to the great satisfaction of Ali, who concluded his bargain and hastened to make use of it. He prepared a false firman, which, according to custom, was enclosed and sealed in a cylindrical case and sent to Yusuf Bey by a Greek, wholly ignorant of the real object of his mission. Opening it without suspicion, Yusuf had his arm blown off and died in consequence, but found time to dispatch a message to Mustai, Pasha of Skoldra, informing him of the catastrophe and warning him to keep good guard. Yusuf's letter was received by Mustai just as a similar infernal machine was placed in his hands under cover to his young wife. The packet was seized, and a careful examination disclosed its nature. The mother of Mustai, a jealous and cruel woman, accused her daughter-in-law of complicity, and the unfortunate Aisha, though shortly to become a mother, expired in agony from the effects of poison, only guilty of being the innocent instrument of her grandfather's treachery. Fortune, having frustrated Ali's schemes concerning Mustai Pasha, offered him as consolation a chance of invading the territory of Parga, the only place in Epirus which had hitherto escaped his rule and which he greedily coveted. Agia, a small Christian town on the coast, had rebelled against him and allied itself to Parga. It provided an excuse for hostilities, and Ali's troops under his son Mukhtar first seized Agia where they only found a few old men to massacre and then marched on to Parga, where the rebels had taken refuge. After a few skirmishes, Mukhtar entered the town, and though the Parganiotes fought bravely, they must inevitably have surrendered had they been left to themselves. But they had sought protection from the French, who had garrisoned the citadel, and the French grenadiers, descending rapidly from the height, charged the Turks with so much fury that they fled in all directions leaving on the field four bimbashis, or captains of a thousand, and a considerable number of killed and wounded. The Pasha's fleet succeeded no better than his army. Issuing from the Gulf of Ambracia, it was intended to attack Parga from the sea, joining in the massacre and cutting off all hope of escape from that side. Ali, meaning to spare neither the garrison nor any male inhabitants over twelve years of age, but... A few shots fired from a small fort dispersed the ships, and a bark manned by sailors from Paxos pursued them, a shot from which killed Ali's admiral on his quarter-deck. He was a Greek of Galaxidi, Athanasius Macris by name. Filled with anxiety, Ali awaited news at Prevesa, where a courier sent off at the beginning of the action had brought him oranges gathered in the orchards of Parga. Ali gave him a purse of gold and publicly proclaimed his success. His joy was redoubled when a second messenger presented two heads of French soldiers and announced that his troops were in possession of the lower part of Parga. Without further delay, he ordered his attendants to mount, entered his carriage, and started triumphantly on the Roman road to Nicopolis. He sent messengers to his generals, ordering them to spare the women and children of Parga intended for his harem, and above all, to take strict charge of the plunder. He was approaching the arena of Nicopolis when a third Tartar messenger informed him of the defeat of his army. Ali changed countenance, and could scarcely articulate the order to return to Prevesa. Once in his palace, he gave way to such fury that all around him trembled, demanding frequently if it could be true that his troops were beaten. "'May your misfortune be upon us,' his attendants answered, prostrating themselves." All at once, looking out on the calm blue sea which lay before his windows, he perceived his fleet doubling Cape Pancrator and re-entering the Ambracian Gulf under full sail. It anchored close by the palace, and on hailing the leading ship, a speaking trumpet announced to Ali the death of his admiral, Athanasius Macris. "'But Parga! Parga!' cried Ali. "'May Allah grant the Pasha long life!' the parganiotes have escaped the sword of his highness it is the will of allah murmured the pasha whose head sank upon his breast in dejection arms having failed ali as usual took refuge in plots and treachery but this time instead of corrupting his enemies with gold he sought to weaken them by division end of chapter six recording by john van stan Savannah, Georgia.
Chapter 7 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1, Ali Pasha by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The French commander, Nicole, surnamed the Pilgrim, on account of a journey he had once made to Mecca, had spent six months at Yanina with a brigade of artillery which General Marmont, then commanding in the Illyrian provinces, had for a time placed at Ali's disposal. The old officer had acquired the esteem and friendship of the pasha, whose leisure he had often amused by stories of his campaigns and various adventures, and although it was now long since they had met, he still had the reputation of being Ali's friend. Ali prepared his plans accordingly. He wrote a letter to Colonel Nicole, apparently in continuation of a regular correspondence between them in which he thanked the colonel for his continued affection, and besought him by various powerful motives to surrender Parga, of which he promised him the governorship during the rest of his life. He took good care to complete his treason by allowing the letter to fall into the hands of the chief ecclesiastics of Parga, who fell head foremost into the trap. Seeing that the tone of the letter was in perfect accordance with the former friendly relations between their French governor and the pasha, they were convinced of the former's treachery. But the result was not as Ali had hoped. The Parganiotes resumed their former negotiations with the English, preferring to place their freedom in the hands of a Christian nation rather than to fall under the rule of a Mohammedan satrap. The English immediately sent a messenger to Colonel Nicole, offering honorable conditions of capitulation. The colonel returned a decided refusal, and threatened to blow up the place if the inhabitants, whose intentions he guessed, made the slightest hostile movement. However, a few days later the citadel was taken at night, owing to the treachery of a woman who admitted an English detachment, and the next day, to the general astonishment, the British standard floated over the Acropolis of Parca. All Greece was then profoundly stirred by a faint gleam of the dawn of liberty, and shaken by a suppressed agitation. The Bourbons again reigned in France, and the Greeks built a thousand hopes on an event which changed the basis of the whole European policy. Above all, they reckoned on powerful assistance from Russia. But England had already begun to dread anything which could increase either the possessions or the influence of this formidable power. Above all, she was determined that the Ottoman Empire should remain intact, and that the Greek navy, beginning to be formidable, must be destroyed. With these objects in view, negotiations with Ali Pasha were resumed. The latter was still smarting under his recent disappointment, and to all overtures answered only, Parga! I must have Parga! And the English were compelled to yield it. Trusting to the word of General Campbell, who had formally promised on its surrender that Parga should be classed along with the seven Ionian Isles, its grateful inhabitants were enjoying a delicious rest after the storm, when a letter from the Lord High Commissioner, addressed to Lieutenant Colonel de Bosset, undeceived them, and gave warning of the evils which were to burst on the unhappy town. On the 25th of March, 1817, notwithstanding the solemn promise made to the Parganiotes, when they admitted the British troops, that they should always be on the same footing as the Ionian Isles, a treaty was signed at Constantinople by the British plenipotentiary, which stipulated the complete and stipulated secession of Parga, and all its territories to the Ottoman Empire. Soon there arrived at Yanina Sir John Cartwright, the English consul at Patras, to arrange for the sale of the lands of the Parganiotes and discuss the conditions of their emigration. Never before had any such compact disgraced European diplomacy, accustomed hitherto to regard Turkish encroachments as simple sacrilege. But Ali Pasha fascinated the English agents, overwhelming them with favors, honors, and feasts, carefully watching them all the while. Their correspondence was intercepted, and he endeavored by means of his agents to rouse the Parganiotes against them. The latter lamented bitterly and appealed to Christian Europe, which remained deaf to their cries. In the name of their ancestors, they demanded the rights which had been guaranteed them. "'They will buy our lands,' they said. "'Have we asked to sell them? And even if we received their value, can gold give us a country and the tombs of our ancestors?' Ali Pasha invited the Lord High Commissioner of Great Britain, Sir Thomas Maitland, to a conference at Prevesa and complained of the exorbitant price of one million five hundred thousand, at which the commissioners had estimated Parga and its territory, including private property and church furniture. 
It had been hoped that Ali's avarice would hesitate at this high price, but he was not so easily discouraged. He gave a banquet for the Lord High Commissioner, which degenerated into a shameless orgy. In the midst of this drunken hilarity, the Turk and the Englishman disposed of the territory of Parga, agreeing that a fresh estimate should be made on the spot by experts chosen by both English and Turks. The result of this valuation was that the indemnity granted to the Christians was reduced by the English to the sum of 276,075 sterling, instead of the original 500,000. And as Ali's agents only arrived at the sum of 56,750, a final conference was held at Bathrotum between Ali and the Lord High Commissioner. The latter then informed the Parganiotes that the indemnity allowed them was irrevocably fixed at 150,000. The transaction is a disgrace to the egotistical and venal nation which thus allowed the life and liberty of a people to be trifled with, a lasting blot on the honor of England. The Parganiotes at first could believe neither in the infamy of their protectors nor in their own misfortune but both were soon confirmed by a proclamation of the Lord High Commissioner, informing them that the Pasha's army was marching to take possession of the territory, which by May 10th must be abandoned for ever. The fields were then in full bearing. In the midst of plains ripening for a rich harvest were 80,000 square feet of olive trees, alone estimated at 200,000 guineas. The sun shone in cloudless azure, the air was balmy with the scent of orange trees, of pomegranates and citrons, but the lovely country might have been inhabited by phantoms. Only hands raised to heaven and brows bent to the dust met one's eyes. Even the very dust belonged no more to the wretched inhabitants. They were forbidden to take a fruit or a flower. The priests might not remove either relics or sacred images. Church, ornaments, torches, tapers, pyxes had by this treaty all become Mohammedan property. The English had sold everything, even to the host. Two days more, and all must be left. Each was silently marking the door of the dwelling destined so soon to shelter an enemy with a red cross, when suddenly a terrible cry echoed from street to street, for the Turks had been perceived on the heights overlooking the town. Terrified and despairing, the whole population hastened to fall prostrate before the Virgin of Parga, the ancient guardian of their citadel. A mysterious voice, proceeding from the sanctuary, reminded them that the English had, in their iniquitous treaty, forgotten to include the ashes of those who may happier fate had spared the sight of the ruin of Parga. Instantly they rushed to the graveyards, tore open the tombs, and collected the bones and putrefying corpses. The beautiful olive trees were felled, an enormous funeral pyre arose, and in the general excitement the orders of the English chief were defied. With naked daggers in their hands, standing in the crimson light of the flames which were consuming the bones of their ancestors, the people of Parga vowed to slay their wives and children, and to kill themselves to the last man if the infidels dared to set foot in the town before the appointed hour. Xenocles, the last of the Greek poets, inspired by this sublime manifestation of despair, even as Jeremiah, by the fall of Jerusalem, improvised a hymn which expresses all the griefs of the exiles, and which the exiles interrupted by their tears and sobs. A messenger crossing the sea in all haste informed the Lord High Commissioner of the terrible threat of the Parganiotes. He started at once, accompanied by General Sir Frederick Adams, and landed at Parga by the light of the funeral pyre. He was received with ill-concealed indignation, and with assurances that the sacrifice would be at once consummated unless Ali's troops were held back. The general endeavored to console and to reassure the unhappy people, and then proceeded to the outposts, traversing silent streets in which armed men stood at each door only waiting a signal before slaying their families, and then turning their weapons against the English and themselves. He implored them to have patience and they answered by pointing to the approaching Turkish army and bidding him hasten. He arrived at last and commenced negotiations, and the Turkish officers, no less uneasy than the English garrison, promised to wait till the appointed hour. The next day passed in mournful silence, quiet as death. At sunset on the following day, May ninth, 1819, the English standard on the castle of Pargo was hauled down, and after a night spent in prayer and weeping, the Christians demanded the signal of departure. They had left their dwellings at break of day, and scattering on the shore, endeavored to collect some relics of their country. 
some filled little bags with ashes withdrawn from the funeral pile others took handfuls of earth while the women and children picked up pebbles which they hid in their clothing and pressed to their bosoms as if fearing to be deprived of them meanwhile the ships intended to transport them arrived and armed english soldiers superintended the embarkation which the turks hailed from afar with ferocious cries parganiotes were landed in corfu where they suffered yet more injustice under various pretexts the money promised them was reduced and withheld until destitution compelled them to accept the little that was offered thus closed one of the most odious transactions which modern history has been compelled to record the satrap of yanina had arrived at the fulfilment of his wishes in the retirement of his fairy-like palace by the lake he could enjoy voluptuous pleasures to the fool but already seventy-eight years had passed over his head and old age had laid the burden of infirmity upon him his dreams were dreams of blood and vainly he sought refuge in chambers glittering with gold adorned with arabesques decorated with costly armor and covered with the richest of oriental carpets remorse stood ever beside him through the magnificence which surrounded him there constantly passed the gale spectre of emina leading onwards a vast procession of mournful phantoms and the guilty pasha buried his face in his hands and shrieked aloud for help sometimes ashamed of his weakness he endeavored to defy both the reproaches of his conscience and the opinion of the multitude and sought to encounter criticism with bravado if by chance he overheard some blind singer chanting in the streets the satirical verses which faithful to the poetical and mocking genius of them ancestors the greeks frequently composed about him he would order the singer to be brought would bid him repeat his verses and applauding him would relate some fresh anecdote of cruelty saying go add that to thy tale let thy hearers know what i can do let them understand that i stop at nothing in order to overcome my foes if i reproach myself with anything it is only with the deeds i have sometimes failed to carry out sometimes it was the terrors of the life after death which assailed him the thought of eternity brought terrible visions in its trains and ali shuddered at the prospect of al sirat that awful bridge narrow as a spider's thread and hanging over the furnaces of hell which a mussulman must cross in order to arrive at the gate of paradise he ceased to joke about iblis the prince of evil and sank by degrees into profound superstition he was surrounded by magicians and soothsayers he consulted omens and demanded talismans and charms from the dervishes which he had either sewn into his garments or suspended in the most secret parts of his palace in order to avert evil influences a koran was hung about his neck as a defence against the evil eye and frequently he removed it and knelt before it as did louis the eleventh before the leaden figures of saints which adorned his hat he ordered a complete chemical laboratory from venice and engaged alchemists to distill the water of immortality by the help of which he hoped to ascend to the planets and discover the philosopher's stone not perceiving any practical result of their labors he ordered the laboratory to be burnt and the alchemists to be hung ali hated his fellow-men he would have liked to leave no survivors and often regretted his inability to destroy all those who would have cause to rejoice at his death consequently he sought to accomplish as much harm as he could during the time which remained to him and for no possible reason but that of hatred he caused the arrest of both ibrahim pasha who had already suffered so much at his hands and his son and confined them both in a dungeon purposely constructed under the grand staircase of the castle by the lake in order that he might have the pleasure of passing over their heads each time he left his apartments or returned to them it was not enough for ali merely to put to death those who had displeased him the form of punishment must be constantly varied in order to produce a fresh mode of suffering therefore new tortures had to be constantly invented now it was a servant guilty of absence without leave who was bound to a stake in the presence of his sister and destroyed by a cannon placed six paces off but only loaded with powder in order to prolong the agony now a christian accused of having tried to blow up yanina by introducing mice with tinder fastened to their tails into the powder magazine who was shut up in the cage of ali's favorite tiger and devoured by it the pasha despised the human race as much as he hated it 
a european having reproached him with cruelty shown to his subjects ali replied you do not understand the race with which i have to deal were i to hang a criminal on yonder tree the sight would not deter even his own brother from stealing in the crowd at its foot if i had an old man burnt alive his son would steal the ashes and sell them oh, the rabble can be governed by fear only and i am the one man who does it successfully his conduct perfectly corresponded to his ideas one great feast day two gypsies devoted their lives in order to avert the evil destiny of the pasha and solemnly convoking on their own heads all misfortunes which might possibly befall him cast themselves down from the palace roof one arose without difficulty stunned and suffering the other remained on the ground with a broken leg ali gave them each forty francs and an annuity of two pounds of maize daily and considering this sufficient took no further trouble about them every year at ramadan a large sum was distributed in alms among poor women without distinction of sect but ali contrived to change this act of benevolence into a barbarous form of amusement as he possessed several palaces in yanina at a considerable distance from each other the one at which a distribution was to take place was each day publicly announced and when the women had waited there for an hour or two exposed to the sun rain or cold as the case might be they were suddenly informed that they must go to some other palace at the opposite end of the town when they got there they usually had to wait for another hour fortunate if they were not sent off to a third place of meeting when the time at length arrived a eunuch appeared followed by albanian soldiers armed with staves carrying a bag of money which he threw by handfuls right into the midst of the assembly then began a terrible uproar the women rushed to catch it upsetting each other quarrelling fighting and uttering cries of terror and pain while the albanians pretending to enforce order pushed into the crowd striking right and left with their batons the pasha meanwhile sat at a window enjoying the spectacle and impartially applauding all well-delivered blows no matter whence they came during these distributions which really benefited no one many women were always severely hurt and some died from the blows they had received ali maintained several carriages for himself and his family but allowed no one else to share in this prerogative to avoid being jolted he simply took up the pavement in yanina and the neighboring towns with the result that in summer one was choked by dust and in winter one could hardly get through the mud he rejoiced in the public inconvenience and one day having to go out in heavy rain he remarked to one of the officers of his escort how delightful to be driven through this in a carriage while you will have the pleasure of following on horseback you will be wet and dirty whilst i smoke my pipe and laugh at your condition he could not understand why western sovereigns should permit their subjects to enjoy the same conveniences and amusements as themselves if i had a theatre he said i would allow no one to be present at performances except my own children but these idiotic christians do not know how to uphold their own dignity there was no end to the mystifications which it amused the pasha to carry out with those who approached him one day he chose to speak turkish to a maltese merchant who came to display some jewels he was informed that the merchant understood only greek and italian he none the less continued his discourse without allowing any one to translate what he said into greek the maltese at length lost patience shut up his cases and departed ali watched him with the utmost calm and as he went out told him still in turkish to come again the next day an unexpected occurrence seemed like the warning finger of destiny to indicate an evil omen for the pasha's future misfortunes arrive in troops says the forcible turkish proverb and a forerunner of disasters came to ali pasha one morning he was suddenly roused by the sheik yusuf who had forced his way in in spite of the guards behold said he handing ali a letter allah who punishes the guilty has permitted thy seraglio of tepelen to be burnt thy splendid palace thy beautiful furniture costly stuffs cashmeres furs arms all are destroyed and it is thy youngest and best beloved son salik bey himself whose hand kindled the flames 
So saying, Yusuf turned and departed, crying with a triumphant voice, Fire! 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 And Ali instantly ordered his horse, and followed by his guards, rode without drawing rein to Tepelen. As soon as he arrived at the place where his palace had formerly insulted the public misery, he hastened to examine the cellars where his treasures were deposited. All was intact. Silver plate, jewels, and fifty millions of francs in gold, enclosed in a well over which he had caused a tower to be built. After this examination, he ordered all the ashes to be carefully sifted in hopes of recovering the gold in the tassels and fringes of the sofas, and the silver from the plate and the armor. He next proclaimed, through the length and breadth of the land, that being by the hand of Allah deprived of his house, and no longer possessing anything in his native town, he requested all who loved him to prove their affection by bringing help in proportion. He fixed the day of reception for each commune, and for almost each individual of any rank, however small, according to their distance from Tepelen, whither these evidences of loyalty were to be brought. During five days, Ali received these forced benevolences from all parts. He sat covered with rags on a shabby palm-leaf mat placed at the outer gate of his ruined palace, holding in his left hand a villainous pipe of the kind used by the lowest people, and in his right an old red cap, which he extended for the donations of the passers-by. Behind stood a Jew from Yanina charged with the office of testing each piece of gold and valuing jewels which were offered instead of money, for in terror each endeavored to appear generous. No means of obtaining a rich harvest were neglected, for instance— Ali distributed secretly large sums among poor and obscure people, such as servants, mechanics, and soldiers, in order that by returning them in public they might appear to be making great sacrifices, so that richer and more distinguished persons could not, without appearing ill-disposed towards the pasha, offer only the same amount as did the poor, but were obliged to present gifts of enormous value. After this charity extorted from their fears, the pasha's subjects hoped to be at peace. But a new decree proclaimed throughout Albania required them to rebuild and refurnish the formidable palace of Tepelen entirely at the public expense. Ali then returned to Yanina, followed by his treasure and a few women who had escaped from the flames, and whom he disposed of amongst his friends, saying that he was no longer sufficiently wealthy to maintain so many slaves." Fate soon provided him with a second opportunity for amassing wealth. Arta, a wealthy town with a Christian population, was ravaged by the plague, and out of 8,000 inhabitants, 7,000 were swept away. Hearing this, Ali hastened to send commissioners to prepare an account of furniture and lands which the pasha claimed as being heir to his subjects. A few livid and emaciated specters were yet to be found in the streets of Arta, in order that the inventory might be more complete, these unhappy beings were compelled to wash in the Inachus blankets, sheets, and clothes steeped in bubonic infection, while the collectors were hunting everywhere for imaginary hidden treasure. Hollow trees were sounded, walls pulled down, the most unlikely corners examined, and a skeleton which was discovered still girt with a belt containing Venetian sequins was gathered up with the utmost care. The archons of the town were arrested and tortured in the hope of discovering buried treasure, the clue to which had disappeared along with the owners. One of these magistrates, accused of having hidden some valuable objects, was plunged up to his shoulders in a boiler full of melted lead and boiling oil. Old men, women, children, rich and poor alike, were interrogated, beaten, and compelled to abandon the last remains of their property in order to save their lives. Having thus decimated the few inhabitants remaining to the town, it became necessary to repeople it. With this object in view, Ali's emissaries overran the villages of Thessaly, driving before them all the people they met in flocks, and compelling them to settle in Arta. These unfortunate colonists were also obliged to find money to pay the pasha for the houses they were forced to occupy. This business being settled, Ali turned to another which had long been on his mind. We have seen how Ismael Pasho Bey escaped the assassin sent to murder him. A ship, dispatched secretly from Prevesa, arrived at the palace of his retreat. The captain, posing as a merchant, invited Ismael to come on board and inspect his goods. 
but the latter guessing a trap fled promptly and for some time all trace of him was lost ali in revenge turned his wife out of the palace at janina which she still occupied and placed her in a cottage where she was obliged to earn a living by spinning but he did not stop there and learning after some time that pacho bey had sought refuge with the nazir of drama who had taken him into favor he resolved to strike a last blow more sure and more terrible than the others again ismail's lucky star saved him from the plots of his enemy during a hunting party he encountered a kapijibachi or messenger from the sultan who asked him where he could find the nazir to whom he was charged with an important communication as kapijibachis are frequently bearers of evil tidings which it is well to ascertain at once and as the nazir was at some distance pacho bey assumed the latter's part and the sultan's confidential messenger informed him that he was the bearer of a firman granted at the request of ali pasha of yanina ali of tepelinir he is my friend how can i serve him by executing the present order sent you by the divan desiring you to behead a traitor named pacho bey who crept into your service a short time ago uh, w willingly i but he is not an easy man to seize being brave vigorous clever and cunning craft will be necessary in this case he may appear at any moment and it is advisable that he should not see you let no one suspect who you are but go to drama which is only two hours distant and await me there i shall return this evening and you can consider your errand as accomplished the kabijibachi made a sign of comprehension and directed his course toward drama while ismail fearing that the nazir who had only known him a short time would sacrifice him with the usual turkish indifference fled in the opposite direction at the end of an hour he encountered a bulgarian monk with whom he exchanged clothes a disguise which enabled him to traverse upper macedonia in safety arriving at the great servian convent in the mountains whence the oxius takes its rise he obtained admission under an assumed name but feeling sure of the discretion of the monks after a few days he explained his situation to them ali learning the ill success of his latest stratagem accused the nazir of conniving at pacho bey's escape but the latter easily justified himself with the divan by giving precise information of what had really occurred this was what ali wanted who profited thereby in having the fugitive's track followed up and soon got wind of his retreat as pacho bey's innocence had been proved in the explanations given to the port the death firman obtained against him became useless and ali affected to abandon him to his fate in order the better to conceal the new plot he was conceiving against him athanasius vaya a chief assassin of the kardikiotes to whom ali imparted his present plan for the destruction of ismail begged for the honor of putting it into execution swearing that this time ismail should not escape the master and the instrument disguised their scheme under the appearance of a quarrel which astonished the whole town at the end of a terrible scene which took place in public ali drove the confidant of his crimes from the palace overwhelming him with insults and declaring that were athanasius not the son of his children's foster mother he would have sent him to the gibbet he enforced his words by the application of a stick and via apparently overwhelmed by terror and affliction went round to all the nobles of the town vainly entreating them to intercede for him the only favor which mukhtar pasha could obtain for him was a sentence of exile allowing him to retreat to macedonia athanasius departed from yanina with all the demonstrations of utter despair and continued his route with haste of one who fears pursuit arrived in macedonia he assumed the habit of a monk and undertook a pilgrimage to mount athos saying that both the disguise and the journey were necessary to his safety on the way he encountered one of the itinerant friars of the great servian convent to whom he described his disgrace in energetic terms begging him to obtain his admission among the lay brethren of his monastery delighted at the prospect of bringing back to the fold of the church a man so notorious for his crimes the friar hastened to inform his superior who in his turn lost no time in announcing to pacho bey that his compatriot and companion in misfortune was to be received among the lay brethren and in relating the history of athanasius as he himself had heard it pacho bey however was not easily deceived 
and at once guessing that Vaya's real object was his own assassination, told his doubts to the superior, who had already received him as a friend. The latter retarded the reception of Vaya so as to give Pacho time to escape and take the road to Constantinople. Once arrived there, he determined to brave the storm and encounter Ali openly. Endowed by nature with a noble presence and with masculine firmness, Pacho Bey possessed also the valuable gift of speaking all the various tongues of the Ottoman Empire. He could not fail to distinguish himself in the capital and to find an opening for his great talents. But his inclination drove him at first to seek his fellow exiles from Epirus, who were either his old companions in arms, friends of relations, for he was allied to all the principal families and was even through his wife, nearly connected with his enemy Ali Pasha himself. He had learnt what this unfortunate lady had already endured on his account, and feared that she would yet suffer more if he took active measures against the pasha. While he yet hesitated between affection and revenge, he heard that she had died of grief and misery. Now that despair had put an end to uncertainty, he set his hand to the work. At this precise moment, heaven sent him a friend to console and aid him in his vengeance, a Christian from Italia, Paleopulo by name. This man was on the point of establishing himself in Russian uh, Bessarabia, when he met Pacho Bey and joined with him in the singular coalition which was to change the fate of the Tepelinian dynasty. Paleopulo reminded his companion in misfortune of a memorial presented to the Divan in 1812, which had brought upon Ali a disgrace from which he only escaped in consequence of the overwhelming political events which just then absorbed the attention of the Ottoman government. The Grand Seigneur had sworn by the tombs of his ancestors to attend to the matter as soon as he was able, and it was only requisite to remind him of his vow. Pacho Bey and his friend drew up a new memorial, and knowing the Sultan's avarice, took care to dwell on the immense wealth possessed by Ali, on his scandalous exactions, and on the enormous sums diverted from the imperial treasury. By overhauling the accounts of his administration, millions might be recovered. To these financial considerations, Pacho Bey added some practical ones. Speaking as a man sure of his facts and well acquainted with the ground, he pledged his head that, with twenty thousand men, he would, in spite of Ali's troops and strongholds, arrive before Yanina without firing a musket. However good these plans appeared, they were by no means to the taste of the Sultan's ministers, who were each and all in receipt of large pensions from the man at whom they struck. Besides, as in Turkey it is customary for the great fortunes of government officials to be absorbed on their death by the imperial treasury, it of course appeared easier to await the natural inheritance of Ali's treasures than to attempt to seize them by a war, which would only certainly absorb part of them. Therefore, while Pacho Bey's zeal was commended, he obtained only dilatory answers, followed at length by a formal refusal. Meanwhile, the old Italian. Paleopolo died, having prophesied the approaching Greek insurrection among his friends, and pledged Pacho Bey to persevere in his plans of vengeance, assuring him that, before long, Ali would certainly fall a victim to them. Thus left alone, Pacho, before taking any active steps in his work of vengeance, affected to give himself up to the strictest observances of the Mohammedan religion. Ali, who had established a most minute surveillance over his actions, finding that his time was spent with ulamas and dervishes, imagined that he had ceased to be dangerous and took no further trouble about him. End of chapter 7 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 8 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 7, Part 1 Ali Pasha by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 A career of successful crime had established Ali's rule over a population equal to that of the two kingdoms of Sweden and Norway. But his ambition was not yet satisfied. The occupation of Parga did not crown his desires, and the delight which it caused him was much tempered by the escape of the Parganiotes, who found in exile a safe refuge from his persecution. Scarcely had he finished the conquest of Middle Albania before he was exciting a faction against the young Mustai Pasha in Skodra, a new object of greed. He also kept an army of spies in Wallachia, Moldavia, Thrace, and Macedonia, 
and thanks to them he appeared to be everywhere present and was mixed up in every intrigue private or political throughout the empire he had paid the english agents the price agreed on for parga but he had repaid himself five times over by gifts extorted from his vassals and by the value of the parga lands now become his property his palace of tepelan had been rebuilt at the public expense and was larger and more magnificent than before Yanina was embellished with new buildings elegant pavilions rose on the shores of the lake in short ali's luxury was on a level with his vast riches his sons and grandsons were provided for by important positions and ali himself was sovereign prince in everything but the name there was no lack of flattery even from literary persons at vienna a poem was pointed in his honor and a french greek grammar was dedicated to him and such titles as most illustrious most powerful and most clement were showered upon him as upon a man whose lofty virtues and great exploits echoed through the world a native of bergamo learned in heraldry provided him with a coat of arms representing on a field gulls a lion embracing three cubs emblematic of the telepanian dynasty already he had a consul at lucadia accepted by the english who it is said encouraged him to declare himself hereditary prince of greece under the nominal suzerainty of their sultan and their real intention being to use him as a tool in return for their protection and to employ him as a political counterbalance to the hospodars of madavia and wallachia who for the last twenty years had been simply russian agents in disguise this was not all many of the adventurers with whom the levant swarms outlaws from every country had found a refuge in albania and helped not a little to excite ali's ambition by their suggestions some of these men frequently saluted him as king a title which he affected to reject with indignation and he disdained to imitate other states by raising a private standard of his own preferring not to compromise his real power by puerile displays of dignity and he lamented the foolish ambition of his children who would ruin him he said by aiming each at becoming a vizier therefore he did not place his hope or confidence in them but in the adventurers of every sort and kind pirates coiners renegades assassins whom he kept in his pay and regarded as his best support these he sought to attach to his person as men who might some day be found useful for he did not allow the many favors of fortune to blind him to the real danger of his position a vizier he was answered resembles a man wrapped in costly furs but he sits on a barrel of powder which only requires a spark to explode it the divan granted all the concessions which ali demanded affecting ignorance of his projects of revolt and his intelligence with the enemies of the state but then apparent weakness was merely prudent temporizing it was considered that ali already advanced in years could not live much longer and it was hoped that at his death continental greece now in some measure detached from the ottoman rule would again fall under the sultan's sway meanwhile pacho bey bent on silently undermining ali's influence had established himself as an intermediary for all those who came to demand justice on account of the pasha's exactions and he contrived that both his own complaints and those of his clients should penetrate to the ears of the sultan who pitying his misfortunes made him a kibiji bachi as a commencement of better things about this time the sultan also admitted to the council a certain abdi effendi of larissa one of the richest nobles of thessaly who had been compelled by the tyranny of veli pasha to fly from his country the two new dignitaries having secured khalid effendi as a partisan resolved to profit by his influence to carry out their plans of vengeance on the tepelinian family the news of pacho bey's promotion roused ali from the security in which he was plunged and he fell a prey to the most lively anxiety comprehending at once the evil which this man trained in his own school might cause him he exclaimed ah if heaven would only restore me the strength of my youth i would plunge my sword into his heart even in the midst of the divan it was not long before ali's enemies found an extremely suitable opportunity for opening their attack veli pasha who had for his own profit increased the thessalian taxation fivefold 
had in doing so caused so much oppression that many of the inhabitants preferred the griefs and dangers of emigration rather than remain under so tyrannical a rule a great number of greeks sought refuge at odessa and the great turkish families assembled round pacho bay and abdi effendi at constantinople who lost no opportunity of interceding in their favour the sultan who as yet did not dare to act openly against the tepelenian family was at least able to relegate veli to the obscure post of lepanto and veli much disgusted was obliged to obey he quitted the new palace he had just built at rapahani and betook himself to the place of exile accompanied by actors bohemian dancers bear leaders and a crowd of prostitutes thus attacked in the person of his most powerful son ali thought to terrify his enemies by a daring blow he sent three albanians to constantinople to assassinate pacho bey they fell upon him as he was proceeding to the mosque of st sophia on the day on which the sultan also went in order to be present at the friday ceremonial prayer and fired several shots at him he was wounded but not mortally the assassins caught red-handed were hung at the gate of the imperial seraglio but not before confessing that they were sent by the pasha of yanina the divan comprehending at last that so dangerous a man must be dealt with at any cost recapitulated all ali's crimes and pronounced a sentence against him which was confirmed by a decree of the grand mufti it set forth that ali tepelan having many times obtained pardon for his crimes was now guilty of high treason in the first degree and that he would as recalcitrant be placed under the ban of the empire if he did not within forty days appear at the gilded threshold of the felicitous gate of the monarch who dispenses crowns to the princes who reign in this world in order to justify himself as may be supposed submission to such an order was about the last thing ali contemplated as he failed to appear the divan caused the grand mufti to launch the thunder of excommunication against him ali had just arrived at parga which he now saw for the third time since he had obtained it when his secretaries informed him that only the rod of moses could save him from the anger of pharaoh a figurative mode of warning him that he had nothing to hope for but ali counting on his usual luck persisted in imagining that he could once again escape from his difficulty by the help of gold and intrigue without discontinuing the pleasures in which he was immersed he contented himself with sending presents and humble petitions to constantinople but both were alike useless for no one even ventured to transmit them to the sultan who had sworn to cut off the head of any one who dared mention the name of ali tepelan in his presence receiving no answer to his overtures ali became a prey to terrible anxiety as he one day opened the koran to consult it as to his future his divining rod stopped at verse eighty two chapter nineteen which says he doth flatter himself in vain he shall appear before our tribunal naked and bare ali closed the book and spat three times into his bosom he was yielding to the most dire presentiments when a courier arriving from the capital informed him that all hope of pardon was lost he ordered his galley to be immediately prepared and left his seraglio casting a look of sadness on the beautiful gardens where only yesterday he had received the homage of his prostrate slaves he bade farewell to his wives saying that he hoped soon to return and descended to the shore where the rowers received him with acclamations the sail was set to a favorable breeze and ali leaving the shore he was never to see again sailed towards Eravesa, where he hoped to meet the lord high commissioner maitland but the time of prosperity had gone by and the regard which had once been shown him changed with his fortunes the interview he sought was not granted the sultan now ordered a fleet to be equipped which after ramadan was to disembark troops on the coast of epirus while all the neighboring pashas received orders to hold themselves in readiness to march with all the troops of their respective governments against ali whose name was struck out of the list of viziers pasha bey was named pasha of yanina and delvino on condition of subduing them and was placed in command of the whole expedition however notwithstanding these orders there was not at the beginning of april two months after the attempted assassination of pacho bey a single soldier ready to march on albania ramadan that year did not close until the new moon of july 
had ali put himself boldly at the head of a movement which was beginning to stir throughout greece he might have baffled these vacillating projects and possibly dealt a fatal blow to the ottoman empire as far back as eighteen o eight the hadriotes had offered to recognize his son veli then vizier of the morea as their prince and to support him in every way if he would proclaim the independence of the archipelago the moreans bore him no enmity until he refused to help them to freedom and would have returned to him had he consented on the other side the sultan though anxious for war would not spend a penny in order to wage it and it was not easy to corrupt some of the great vassals ordered to march at their own expense against a man in whose downfall they had no special interest nor were the means of seduction wanting to ali whose wealth was enormous but he preferred to keep it in order to carry on the war which he thought he could no longer escape he made therefore a general appeal to all albanian warriors whatever their religion mussulmans and christians alike attracted by the prospect of booty and good pay flocked to his standard in crowds he organized all these adventurers on the plain of armatus by companies placing a captain of his own choice at the head of each and giving each company a special post to defend of all possible plans this was the best adapted to his country where only a guerrilla warfare can be carried on and where a large army could not subsist in repairing to the posts assigned to them these troops committed such terrible depredations that the provinces sent to constantinople demanding their suppression the divan answered the petitioners that it was their own business to suppress these disorders and to induce the clefots to turn their arms against ali who had nothing to hope from the clemency of the grand seigneur at the same time circular letters were addressed to the epirotes warning them to abandon the cause of a rebel and to consider the best means of freeing themselves from a traitor who having long oppressed them now sought to draw down on their country all the terrors of war ali who everywhere maintained numerous and active spies now redoubled his watchfulness and not a single letter entered epirus without being opened and read by his agents as an extra precaution the guardians of the passes were enjoined to slay without mercy any dispatch-bearer not provided with an order signed by ali himself and to send to janina under escort any travellers wishing to enter epirus these measures were specially aimed against suleiman pasha who had succeeded veli in the government of thessaly and replaced ali himself in the office of grand provost of the highways suleiman's secretary was a greek named agnanorto a native of macedonia whose estates ali had seized and who had fled with his family to escape further persecution he had become attached to the court party less for the sake of vengeance on ali than to aid the cause of the greeks for whose freedom he worked by underhand methods he persuaded suleiman pasha that the greeks would help him to dethrone ali for whom they cherished the deepest hatred and he was determined that they should learn the sentence of deprivation and excommunication fulminated against the rebel pasha he introduced into the greek translation which he was commissioned to make ambiguous phrases which were read by the christians as a call to take up arms in the cause of liberty in an instant all hellas was up in arm the mohammedans were alarmed but the greeks gave out that it was in order to protect themselves and their property against the bands of brigands which had appeared on all sides this was the beginning of the greek insurrection and occurred in may eighteen twenty extending from mount pindus to thermopylae however the greeks satisfied with having vindicated their right to bear arms in their own defence continued to pay their taxes and abstained from all hostility at the news of this great movement ali's friends advised him to turn it to his own advantage oh, the greeks in arms they said want a chief offer yourself as their leader they hate you it is true but this feeling may change it is only necessary to make them believe which is easily done that if they will support your cause you will embrace christianity and give them freedom there was no time to lose for matters became daily more serious ali hastened to summon what he called a grand divan composed of the chiefs of both sects mussulmans and christians there were assembled men of widely different types much astonished at finding themselves in company the venerable gabriel archbishop of janina and uncle of the unfortunate euphrosyne who had been dragged thither by force abbas the old head of the police who had presided at the execution of the christian martyr the holy bishop of velas still bearing the marks of the chains with which ali had loaded him 
and Porphyro, Archbishop of Arta, to whom the turban would have been more becoming than the mitre. Ashamed of the part he was obliged to play, Ali, after long hesitation, decided on speaking and addressing the Christians. "'O oh, Greeks!' he said. "'Examine my conduct with unprejudiced minds, and you will see manifest proofs of the confidence and consideration which I have ever shown you. What pasha has ever treated you as I have done? Who would have treated your priests and the objects of your worship with as much respect? Who else would have conceded the privileges which you enjoy? For you hold rank in my councils, and both the police and the administration of my states are in your hands. I do not, however, seek to deny the evils with which I have afflicted you, but, alas, these evils have been the result of my enforced obedience to the cruel and perfidious orders of the sublime port. It is to the sport that these wrongs must be attributed, for if my actions be attentively regarded, it will be seen that I only did harm when compelled thereto by the course of events. Interrogate my actions, or they will speak more fully than a detailed apology. My position with regard to the Suliotes allowed no half-and-half -half measures. Having once broken with them, I was obliged either to drive them from my country or to exterminate them. I understood the political hatred of the Ottoman cabinet too well not to know that it would declare war against me sooner or later, and I knew that resistance would be impossible. If on one side I had to repel the Ottoman aggression, and on the other to fight against the formidable Suliotes. I might say the same of the Parganiotes. You know that their town was the haunt of my enemies, and each time that I appealed to them to change their ways, they answered only with insults and, and threats. They constantly aided the Suliotes, with whom I was at war, and if at this moment they still were occupying Parga, you would see them throw open the gates of Epirus to the forces of the Sultan. But all this does not prevent my being aware that my enemies blame me severely, and indeed I also blame myself and deplore the faults which the difficulty of my position has entailed upon me. Strong in my repentance, I do not hesitate to address myself to those whom I have most grievously wounded. Thus... I have long since recalled to my service a great number of Suliotes, and those who have responded to my invitation are occupying important posts near my person. But to complete the reconciliation, I have written to those who are still in exile, desiring them to return fearlessly to their country. And I have certain information that this proposal has been everywhere accepted with enthusiasm, the Suliotes will soon return to their ancestral houses, and, reunited under my standard, will join me in combating the Osmanlis for our common enemies. As to the avarice of which I am accused, it seems easily justified by the constant necessity I was under of satisfying the inordinate cupidity of the Ottoman ministry, which incessantly made me pay dearly for tranquillity. This was a personal affair, I acknowledge, and so also is the accumulation of treasure made in order to support the war which the Divan has at length declared. Here Ali ceased, then having caused a barrel full of gold pieces to be emptied on the floor, he continued, Behold, a part of the treasure I have preserved with so much care, and which has been specially obtained from the Turks, our common enemies, it is yours. I am now more than ever delighted at being the friend of the Greeks. Their bravery is a sure earnest of victory, and we will shortly re-establish the Greek Empire, and drive the Osmanlis across the Bosphorus. O oh, bishops and priests of Isa the prophet, bless the arms of the Christians, your children, O oh, primates! I call upon you to defend your rights, and to rule justly the brave nation associated with my interests." This discourse produced very different impressions on the Christian priests and archons. 
some replied only by raising looks of despair to heaven others murmured their adhesion a great number remained uncertain not knowing what to decide the murdite chief he who had refused to slaughter the cardikiotes declared that neither he nor any skipitar of the latin communion would bear arms against their legitimate sovereign the sultan but his words were drowned by cries of long live ali pasha long live the restorer of liberty uttered by some chiefs of adventurers and brigands end of chapter eight recording by john van stan savannah georgia chapter nine of celebrated crimes volume seven part one ali pasha by alexander dumas translated by george burnham ives this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine yet the next day may twenty fourth eighteen twenty ali addressed a circular letter to his brothers the christians announcing that in future he would consider them as his most faithful subjects and that henceforth he remitted the taxes paid to his own family he wound up by asking for soldiers but the greeks having learnt the instability of his promises remained deaf to his invitations at the same time he sent messengers to the montenegrins and the servians inciting them to revolt and organized insurrections in wallachia and moldavia to the very environs of constantinople whilst the ottoman vassals assembled only in small numbers and very slowly under their respective standards every day there collected round the castle of janina whole companies of toxidae of tapazete and of camide so that ali knowing that ismael pacho bey had boasted that he could arrive in sight of janina without firing a gun said in his turn that he would not treat with the port until he and his troops should be within eight leagues of constantinople he had fortified and supplied with munitions of war acrida avlona cania berat clysora cremiti the port of panormus santi coranta buthrotum delvino argiro castron tepelan parga prevesa sderli paramythia arta the post of the five wells janina and its castles these places contained four hundred and twenty cannons of all sizes for the most part in bronze mounted on siege carriages and seventy mortars besides these there were in the castle by the lake independently of the guns in position forty field pieces sixty mountain guns a number of congreve rockets formerly given him by the english and an enormous quantity of munitions of war finally he endeavored to establish a line of semaphores between janina and prevesa in order to have prompt news of the turkish fleet which was expected to appear on this coast ali whose strength seemed to increase with age saw to everything and appeared everywhere sometimes in a litter borne by his albanians sometimes in a carriage raised into a kind of platform but it was more frequently on horseback that he appeared among his laborers often he sat on the bastions in the midst of the batteries and conversed familiarly with those who surrounded him he narrated the successes formerly obtained against the sultan by kara bazaklia vizier of skodra who like himself had been attained with the sentence of deprivation and excommunication recounting how the rebel pasha shut up in his citadel with seventy-two warriors had seen collapse at his feet the united forces of four great provinces of the ottoman empire commanded by twenty-two pashas who were almost entirely annihilated in one day by the gigis he reminded them also of the brilliant victory gained by passavent oglan pasha of widen of quite recent memory which is celebrated in the warlike songs of the clefts of rumilia almost simultaneously ali's sons mukhtar and veli arrived at janina veli had been obliged or thought himself obliged to evacuate lepanto by superior forces and brought only discouraging news especially as to the wavering fidelity of the turks mukhtar on the contrary who had just made a tour of inspection in the musash had only noticed favorable dispositions and deluded himself with the idea that the caonians who had taken up arms had done so in order to aid his father he was curiously mistaken for these tribes hated ali with a hatred all the deeper for being compelled to conceal it and were only in arms in order to repel aggression 
The advice given by the sons to their father as to the manner of treating the Mohammedans differed widely in accordance with their respective opinions. Consequently, a violent quarrel arose between them, ostensibly on account of this dispute, but in reality on the subject of their father's inheritance, which both equally coveted. Ali had brought all his treasure to Yanina, and thenceforth neither son would leave the neighborhood of so excellent a father. They overwhelmed him with marks of affection, and vowed that the one had left Lepanto and the other Barat only in order to share his danger. Ali was by no means duped by these protestations, of which he divined the motive only too well, and though he had never loved his sons, he suffered cruelly in discovering that he was not beloved by them. Soon he had other troubles to endure. One of his gunners assassinated a servant of Vela's, and Ali ordered the murderer to be punished. But when the sentence was to be carried out, the whole corps of artillery mutinied. In order to save appearances, the pasha was compelled to allow them to ask for the pardon of the criminal whom he dared not punish. This incident showed him that his authority was no longer paramount, and he began to doubt the fidelity of his soldiers. The arrival of the Ottoman fleet further enlightened him to his true position. Mussulman and Christian alike, all the inhabitants of northern Albania, who had hitherto concealed their disaffection under an exaggerated semblance of devotion, now hastened to make their submission to the sultan. The Turks, continuing their success, laid siege to Parga, which was held by Mehemet, Veli's eldest son. He was prepared to make a good defense, but was betrayed by his troops who opened the gates of the town, and he was compelled to surrender at discretion. He was handed over to the commander of the naval forces, by whom he was well treated, being assigned the best cabin in the admiral's ship and given a brilliant suite. He was assured that the sultan, whose only quarrels with his grandfather, would show him favor, and would even deal mercifully with Ali, who, with his treasures, would merely be sent to an important province in Asia Minor. He was induced to write in this strain to his family and friends in order to induce them to lay down their arms. The fall of Parga made a great impression on the Epirotes, who valued its possession far above its real importance. Ali rent his garments and cursed the days of his former good fortune, during which he had neither known how to moderate his resentment, nor to foresee the possibility of any change of fortune. The fall of Parga was succeeded by that of Arta of Mangliana, where it was situated Ali's country house, and of the post of the five wells. Then came a yet more overwhelming piece of news. Omar Brionis, whom Ali, having formerly despoiled of its wealth, had none the less recently appointed general-in-chief, had gone over to the enemy with all his troops. Ali then decided on carrying out a project he had formed in case of necessity, namely, on destroying the town of Yanina, which would afford shelter to the enemy and a point of attack against the fortress in which he was entrenched. When this resolution was known, the inhabitants thought only of saving themselves and their property from the ruin from which nothing could save their country. But most of them were only preparing to depart, when Ali gave leave to the Albanian soldiers yet faithful to him to sack the town. The place was immediately invaded by an unbridled soldiery. The metropolitan church, where Greeks and Turks alike deposited their gold, jewels, and merchandise, even as did the Greeks of old in the temples of the gods, became the first object of pillage. Nothing was respected. The cupboards containing sacred vestments were broken open. So were the tombs of the archbishops, in which were interred reliquaries adorned with precious stones, and the altar itself was defiled with the blood of ruffians who fought for chalices and silver crosses. The town presented an equally terrible spectacle. Neither Christians nor Mussulmans were spared, and the women's apartments, forcibly entered, were given up to violence. Some of the more courageous citizens endeavored to defend their houses and families against these bandits, and the clash of arms mingled with cries and groans. All at once the roar of a terrible explosion rose above the other sounds, and a hail of bombs, shells, grenades, and rockets carried devastation and fire into the differing quarters of the town, which soon presented the spectacle of an immense conflagration. Ali, seated on the great platform of the castle by the lake, which seemed to vomit fire like a volcano, directed the bombardment, pointing out the places which must be burnt. Churches, mosques, libraries, bazaars, houses, 
all were destroyed, and the only thing spared by the flames was the gallows, which remained standing in the midst of the ruins. Of the thirty thousand persons who inhabited Yanina a few hours previously, perhaps one half had escaped, but these had not fled many leagues before they encountered the outposts of the Ottoman army, which, instead of helping or protecting them, fell upon them, plundered them, and drove them towards the camp where slavery awaited them. The unhappy fugitives, taken thus between fire and sword, death behind and slavery before, uttered a terrible cry and fled in all directions. Those who escaped the Turks were stopped in the hill passes by the mountaineers, rushing down to the ray. Only large numbers who held together could force a passage. In some cases, terror bestows extraordinary strength. There were mothers who, with infants at the breast, covered on foot in one day the fourteen leagues which separate Yanina from Arta. But others, seized with the pangs of travail in the midst of their flight, expired in the woods after giving birth to babes who, destitute of succor, did not survive their mothers. And young girls, having disfigured themselves by gashes, hid themselves in caves where they died of terror and hunger. The Albanians, intoxicated with plunder and debauchery, refused to return to the castle, and only thought of regaining their country and enjoying the fruit of their rapine. But they were assailed on the way by peasants covetous of their booty, and by those of Yanina who had sought refuge with them. The roads and passes were strewn with corpses, and the trees by the roadside covered in gibbets. The murderers did not long survive their victims. The ruins of Yanina were still smoking when, on the 19th August, Pasho Bey made his entry. Having pitched his tent out of range of Ali's cannon, he proclaimed aloud the firman which inaugurated him as Pasha of Yanina and Delvino, and then raised the tales, emblem of his dignity. Ali heard on the summit of his keep the acclamations of the Turks, who saluted Pasho Bey, his former servant with the titles of Vali of Epirus and Gatsi of Victorious. After this ceremony, the Qadi read the sentence, confirmed by the Mufti, which declared Tepelen Velizada to have forfeited his dignities and to be excommunicated, adding an injunction to all the faithful that henceforth his name was not to be pronounced except with the addition of Kara, or Black, which is bestowed on those cut off from the congregation of Sunnites or Orthodox Mahomedans. A marabout then cast a stone towards the castle, and the anathema upon Kara Ali was repeated by the whole Turkish army, ending with the cry of, Long live the Sultan! So be it! But it was not by ecclesiastical thunders that three fortresses could be reduced, which were defended by artillerymen drawn from different European armies who had established an excellent school for gunners and bombardiers. The besieged, having replied with hootings of contempt to the acclamations of the besiegers, proceeded to enforce their scorn with well-aimed cannon-shots, while the rebel flotilla, dressed as if for a fete day, passed slowly before the Turks, saluting them with cannon-shot if they ventured near the edge of the lake. This noisy rodomontade did not prevent Ali from being consumed with grief and anxiety. The sight of his own troops now in the camp of Pasho Bey the fear of being forever separated from his sons, the thought of his grandson in the enemy's hands, all oh, threw him into the deepest melancholy, and his sleepless eyes were constantly drowned in tears. He refused his food and sat for seven days with untrimmed beard, clad in mourning on a mat at the door of his antechamber, extending his hands to the soldiers and imploring them to slay him rather than abandon him. His wives, seeing him in this state and concluding all was lost, filled the air with their lamentations. All began to think that grief would bring Ali to the grave, but his soldiers, to whose protestations he at first refused any credit, represented to him that their fate was indissolubly linked with his, Pasho Bey having proclaimed that all taken in arms for Ali would be shot as sharers in rebellion. It was therefore their interest to support his resistance with all their power. They also pointed out that the campaign was already advanced, and that the Turkish army, which had forgotten its siege artillery at Constantinople, could not possibly procure any before the end of October, by which time the rains would begin, and the enemy would probably be short of food. Moreover, in any case, it being impossible to winter in a ruined town, the foe would be driven to seek shelter at a distance. 
These representations, made with warmth conviction and supported by evidence, began to soothe the restless fever which was wasting Ali, and the gentle caresses and persuasions of Basilissa, the beautiful Christian captive, who had now been his wife for some time, completed the cure. At the same time his sister, Kianitsa, gave him an astonishing example of courage. She had persisted in spite of all that could be said in residing in her castle of Libokovo. The population, whom she had cruelly oppressed, demanded her death, but no one dared attack her. Superstition declared that the spirit of her mother, with whom she kept up a mysterious communication, even beyond the portals of the grave, watched over her safety. The menacing form of Kamko had, it was said, appeared to several inhabitants of Tepelen, brandishing bones of the wretched Kardikiotes, and demanding fresh victims with loud cries. The desire of vengeance had urged some to brave these unknown dangers, and twice a warrior clothed in black had warned them back, forbidding them to lay hands on a sacrilegious woman, whose punishment heaven reserved to itself, and twice they had returned upon their footsteps. But soon, ashamed of their terror, they attempted another attack and came attired in the color of the prophet. This time no mysterious stranger speared to forbid their passage, and with a cry they climbed the mountain, listening for any supernatural warning. Nothing disturbed the silence and solitude save the bleating of flocks and the cries of birds of prey. Arrived on the platform of Libokovo, they prepared in silence to surprise the guards, believing the castle full of them. They approached, crawling like hunters who stalk a deer. Already they had reached the gate of the enclosure and prepared to burst it open, when, lo, it opened of itself, and they beheld Kanitsa standing before them, a carabine in her hand, pistols in her belt, for all guard two large dogs. "'Halt, ye daring ones!' she cried. "'Neither my life nor my treasure will ever be at your mercy. "'Let one of you move a step without my permission, "'and this place and the ground beneath your feet will engulf you. Ten thousand pounds of powder are in these cellars. "'I will, however, grant your pardon, unworthy though you are. "'I will even allow you to take these sacks filled with gold. "'They may recompense you for the losses "'which my brother's enemies have recently inflicted on you.' but depart this instant without a word and dare not to trouble me again i have other means of destruction at command besides gunpowder life is nothing to me remember that but your mountains may yet at my command become the tomb of your wives and children go she ceased and her would-be murderers fled in terror shortly after the plague broke out in these mountains Kinitsa had distributed infected garments among gypsies who scattered contagion wherever they went. "'We are indeed of the same blood,' cried Ali with pride when he heard of his sister's conduct, and from that hour he appeared to regain all the fire and audacity of his youth, when a few days later he was informed that Mukhtar and Veli, seduced by the brilliant promises of Pasho Bey, had surrendered Pravesa and Argiro Castron. "'It does not surprise me,' he observed coldly. "'I have long known them to be unworthy of being my sons, "'and henceforth my only children and heirs are those who defend my cause.' "'And on hearing a report that both had been beheaded by Pacho Bey's order, "'he contented himself with saying, uh, "'They betrayed their father and have only received their deserts. "'Speak no more of them.' and to show how little it discouraged him, he redoubled his fire upon the Turks. But the latter, who had at length obtained some artillery, answered his fire with vigor, and began to rally to discrown the old pasha's fortress. Feeling that the danger was pressing, Ali redoubled both his prudence and activity. His immense treasures were the real reason of the war waged against him, and these might induce his own soldiers to rebel in order to become masters of them. He resolved to protect them from either surprise or conquest. The sum necessary for present use was deposited in the powder magazine, so that if driven to extremity it might be destroyed in a moment. The remainder was enclosed in strong boxes and sunk in different parts of the lake. This labor lasted a fortnight, when finally Ali put to death the gypsies who had been employed about it in order that the secret might remain with himself. 
while he thus set his own affairs in order he applied himself to the troubling those of his adversary a great number of suliots had joined the ottoman army in order to assist in the destruction of him who formerly had ruined their country their camp which for a long time had enjoyed immunity from the guns of janina was one day overwhelmed with bombs the suliots were terrified until they remarked that the bombs did not burst they then much astonished proceeded to pick up and examine these projectiles instead of a match they found rolls of paper enclosed in a wooden cylinder which was engraved these words open carefully the paper contained a truly machiavellian letter from ali which began by saying that they were quite justified in having taken up arms against him and added that he now sent them a part of the pay of which the traitorous ismail was defrauding them and that the bombs thrown into their cantonment contained six thousand sequins in gold he begged them to amuse ismail by complaints and recriminations while his gondola should by night fetch one of them to whom he would communicate what more he had to say if they accepted his proposition they were to light three fires as a signal the signal was not long in appearing ali dispatched his barge which took on board a monk the spiritual chief of the suliots he was clothed in sackcloth and repeated the prayers for the dying as one going to execution ali however received him with the utmost cordiality he assured the priest of his repentance his good intentions his esteem for the greek captains and then gave him a paper which startled him considerably it was a despatch intercepted by ali from khalid effendi to the saraske ismail ordering the latter to exterminate all christians capable of bearing arms all male children were to be circumcised and brought up to form a legion drilled in european fashion and the letter went on to explain how the suliots the armatolis the greek races of the mainland and those of the archipelago should be disposed of seeing the effect produced on the monk by the perusal of this paper ali hastened to make him the most advantageous offers declaring that his own wish was to give greece a political existence and only requiring that the suliot captains should send him a certain number of their children as hostages he then had cloaks and arms brought which he presented to the monk dismissing him in haste in order that darkness might favor his return the next day ali was resting with his head on basilissa's lap when he was informed that the enemy was advancing upon the entrenchments which had been raised in the midst of the ruins of janina already the outposts had been forced and the fury of the assailants threatened to triumph over all obstacles ali immediately ordered a sortie of all his troops announcing that he himself would conduct it his master of the horse brought him the famous arab charger called the dervish his chief huntsman presented him with his guns weapons still famous in epirus where they figure in the ballads of the skipitars the first was an enormous gun of versailles manufacture formerly presented by the conqueror of the pyramids to Jizar, the pasha of st jean d'arc who amused himself by enclosing living victims in the walls of his palace in order that he might hear their groans in the midst of his festivals next came a carabine given to the pasha of janina in the name of napoleon eighteen o six then the battle musket of charles the twelfth of sweden and finally the much revered sabre of crim guerai the signal was given the drawbridge crossed the gigis and other adventurers uttered a terrific shout to which the cries of the assailants replied ali placed himself on a height whence his eagle eye sought to discern the hostile chiefs but he called and defied pacho bey in vain perceiving hassan stamboul colonel of the imperial bombardiers outside his battery ali demanded the gun of jazar and laid him dead on the spot he then took the carabine of napoleon and shot with it kikriman bey of sponga whom he had formerly appointed pasha of lepanto the enemy now became aware of his presence and sent a lively fusillade in his direction but the balls seemed to diverge from his person as soon as the smoke cleared he perceived capelan pasha of croy who had been his guest and wounded him mortally in the chest capelan uttered a sharp cry and his terrified horse caused disorder in the ranks ali picked off a large number of officers one after another every shot was mortal and his enemies began to regard him in the light of a destroying angel 
Disorder spread through the forces of the Seraskier, who retreated hastily to his entrenchments. The Suliots, meanwhile, sent a deputation to Ismail offering their submission and seeking to regain their country in a peaceful manner. But, being received by him with the most humiliating contempt, they resolved to make common cause with Ali. They hesitated over the demand for hostages, and at length required Ali's grandson, Hussein Pasha, in exchange. After many difficulties, Ali at length consented, and the agreement was concluded. The Suliots received 500,000 piastres, and 150 charges of ammunition. Hussein Pasha was given up to them, and they left the Ottoman camp at dead of night. Marco Bozzaris remained with 320 men, threw down the palisades, and then ascending Mount Pactorus with his troops, waited for dawn in order to announce his defection to the Turkish army. As soon as the sun appeared, he ordered a general salvo of artillery and shouted his war cry. A few Turks in charge of an outpost were slain, the rest fled. A cry of, To arms! was raised, and the standard of the cross floated before the camp of the infidels. Signs and omens of a coming general insurrection appeared on all sides. There was no lack of prodigies, visions, or popular rumors, and the Mahometans became possessed with the idea that the last hour of their rule in Greece had struck. Ali Pasha favored the general demoralization, and his agents, scattered throughout the land, fanned the flame of revolt. Ismail Pasha was deprived of his title of Seraskier and superseded by Kurshid Pasha, as soon as Ali heard this, he sent a messenger to Kurshid, hoping to influence him in his favor. Ismail, distrusting the Skipitars who formed part of his troops, demanded hostages from them. The Skipitars were indignant, and Ali, hearing of their discontent, wrote inviting them to return to him, and endeavoring to dazzle them by the most brilliant promises. These overtures were received by the offended troops with enthusiasm, and Alexis Nutza, Ali's former general, who had forsaken him for Ismail, but who had secretly returned to his allegiance and acted as a spy on the imperial army, was deputed to treat with him. As soon as he arrived, Ali began to enact a comedy, and the intention of rebutting the accusation of incest with his daughter-in-law, Zobaida, for this charge, which, since Veli himself had revealed the secret of their common shame, could only be met by vague denials, had never ceased to produce a massed unfavorable impression on Nutza's mind. Scarcely had he entered the castle by the lake when Ali rushed to meet him and flung himself into his arms. In presence of his officers and the garrison, he loaded him with the most tender names, calling him his son, his beloved Alexis, his own legitimate child, even as Salik Pasha. He burst into tears, and with terrible oaths called heaven to witness that Mukhtar and Veli, whom he disavowed on account of their cowardice, were the adulterous offspring of Emina's armors. Then, raising his hand against the tomb of her whom he had loved so much, he drew the stupefied Nutza into the recess of a casemate, and sending for Basilissa presented him to her as a beloved son, whom only political considerations had compelled him to keep at a distance, because being born of a Christian mother, he had been brought up in the faith of Jesus. Having thus softened the suspicions of his soldiers, Ali resumed his underground intrigues. The Suliots had informed him that the sultan had made them extremely advantageous offers if they would return to his service, and they demanded pressingly that Ali should give up to them the citadel of Kiafa, which was still in his possession, and which commanded Suli. He replied with the information that he intended, January 26th, to attack the camp of Pasho Bey early in the morning, and requested their assistance. In order to cause a diversion, they were to descend into the valley of Yanina at night, and occupy a position which he pointed out to them, and he gave there the word Flori as password for the night. If successful, he undertook to grant their request. Ali's letter was intercepted and fell into Ismail's hands, who immediately conceived a plan for snaring his enemy in his own toils. When the night fixed by Ali arrived, the Seraskier marched out a strong division under the command of Omar Briones, who had been recently appointed pasha, and who was instructed to proceed along the western slope of Mount Pactorus as far as the village of Besduna, where he was to place an outpost, and then to retire along the other side of the mountain, so that being visible in the starlight, the sentinels placed to watch on the hostile towers might take his men for the Suliots and report to Ali that the position of St. Nicholas assigned to them 
had been occupied as arranged. All preparations for battle were made, and the two mortal enemies, Ismael and Ali, retired to rest, each cherishing the darling hope of shortly annihilating his rival. At break of day, a lively cannonade proceeding from the castle of the lake and from Litharitsa announced that the besieged intended a sortie. Soon Ali's skipatars, preceded by a detachment of French, Italians, and Swiss, rushed through the Ottoman fire and carried the first redoubt, held by Ibrahim Aga Stambul. They found six pieces of cannon which the Turks, notwithstanding their terror, had had time to spike. This misadventure, for they had hoped to turn the artillery against the entrenched camp, decided Ali's men on attacking the second redoubt, commanded by the chief bombardier. The Asiatic troops of Baltagdi Pasha rushed to its defense. At their head appeared the chief, Imwan of the army, mounted on a richly caparisoned mule and repeating the curse fulminated by the mufti against Ali, his adherents, his castles, and even his cannons, which it was supposed might be rendered harmless by these adjurations. Ali's Mohammedan skipatars averted their eyes and spat into their bosoms, hoping thus to escape the evil influence. A superstitious terror was beginning to spread among them when a French adventurer took aim at the Iman and brought him down, amid the acclamations of the soldiers. Whereupon the Asiatics, imagining that Ebli himself fought against them, retired within the entrenchments whither the skipatars, no longer fearing the curse, pursued them vigorously. At the same time, however, a very different action was proceeding at the northern end of the besiegers' entrenchments. Ali left his castle of the lake, preceded by twelve torch-bearers carrying braziers filled with lighted pitchwood, then advanced toward the shore of St. Nicholas, expecting to unite with the Suliotes. He stopped in the middle of the ruins to wait for sunrise, and while there, heard that his troops had carried the battery of Ibrahim Aga Stambul. Overjoyed, he ordered them to press on to the second entrenchment, promising that in an hour, when he should have been joined by the Suliotes, he would support them, and he then pushed forward, preceded by two field pieces with their wagons, and followed by fifteen hundred men as far as a large plateau, on which he perceived at a little distance an encampment which he supposed to be that of the Suliotes. He then ordered the Murdite prince, Kir Lekos, to advance with an escort of twenty-five men and when within hearing distance to wave a blue flag and call out the password. An imperial officer replied with the countersign Flori, and Lekos immediately sent back word to Ali to advance. His orderly hastened back, and the prince entered the camp where he and his escort were immediately surrounded and slain. On receiving the message, Ali began to advance, but cautiously, being uneasy at seeing no signs of the Murdite troop. Suddenly, ferocious cries and a lively fusillade proceeding from the vineyards and thickets announced that he had fallen into a trap and at the same moment omar pasha fell upon his advance guard which broke crying treason ali sabred the fugitives mercilessly but fear carried them away and forced to follow the crowd he perceived the kersales and baltagi pasha descending the side of mount pactorus intending to cut off his retreat he attempted another route hastening towards the road to Degleva, but found it held by the Tabakete under the Bimbashi Aslan of Argiro Castron. He was surrounded. All seemed lost, and feeling that his last hour had come, he thought only of selling his life as dearly as possible. Collecting his bravest soldiers around him, he prepared for a last rush on Omar Pasha, when suddenly, with an inspiration born of despair, he ordered his ammunition wagons to be blown up. The Kersales, who were about to seize them, vanished in the explosion, which scattered a hail of stones and debris far and wide. Under cover of the smoke and general confusion, Ali succeeded in withdrawing his men to the shelter of the guns of his castle of Litaritza, where he continued the fight in order to give time to the fugitives to rally, and to give the support he had promised to those fighting on the other slope, who in the meantime had carried the second battery and were attacking the fortified camp. Here the Saraskia Ismail met them with a resistance so well managed that he was able to conceal the attack he was preparing to make on their rear. Ali, guessing that the object of Ismail's maneuvers was to crush those whom he had promised to help, and unable on account of the distance either to support or to warn them, endeavored to impede Omar Pasha, hoping still that his skipatars might either see or hear him. He encouraged the fugitives who recognized him from afar by his scarlet dolmen, 
by the dazzling whiteness of his horse and by the terrible cries which he uttered for in the heat of battle this extraordinary man appeared to have regained the vigor and audacity of his youth twenty times he led his soldiers to the charge and as often was forced to recoil towards his castles he brought up his reserves but in vain fate had declared against him his troops which were attacking the entrenched camp found themselves taken between two fires and could not help them foaming with passion he threatened to rush singly into the midst of his enemies his officers besought him to calm himself and receiving only refusals at last threatened to lay hands upon him if he persisted in exposing himself like a private soldier subdued by this unaccustomed opposition ali allowed himself to be forced back into the castle by the lake while his soldiers dispersed in various directions but even this defeat did not discourage the fierce pasha reduced to extremity he yet entertained the hope of shaking the ottoman empire and from the recesses of his fortress he agitated the whole of greece the insurrection which he had stirred up without foreseeing what the results might be was spreading with the rapidity of a lighted train of powder and the mahometans were beginning to tremble when at length kurshid pasha having crossed the pindus at the head of an army of eighty thousand men arrived before yanina his tent had hardly been pitched when ali caused a salute of twenty-one guns to be fired in his honor and sent a messenger bearing a letter of congratulation on his safe arrival this letter artful and insinuating was calculated to make a deep impression on kurshid ali wrote that being driven by the infamous lies of a former servant called pacho bey into resisting not indeed the authority of the sultan before whom he humbly bent his head weighed down with years of grief but the perfidious plots of his highness's advisers he considered himself happy in his misfortunes to have dealings with a vizier noted for his lofty qualities he then added that these rare merits had doubtless been very far from being estimated at their proper value by a divan in which men were only classed in accordance with the sums they laid out in gratifying the rapacity of their ministers otherwise how came it about that kurshid pasha viceroy of egypt after the departure of the french the conqueror of the mamelukes was only rewarded for these services by being recalled without a reason having been twice romili valisi why when he should have enjoyed the reward of his labors was he relegated to the obscure post of selenica and when appointed grand vizier and sent to pacify servia instead of being entrusted with the government of this kingdom which he had reconquered for the sultan why was he hastily dispatched to aleppo to repress a trifling sedition of emirs and janissaries now scarcely arrived in the morea his powerful arm was to be employed against an aged man ali then plunged into details related the pillaging avarice and imperious dealings of pacho bey as well as of the pasha's subordinate to him how they had alienated the public mind how they had succeeded in offending the armatoles and especially the suliots who might be brought back to their duty with less trouble than these imprudent chiefs had taken to estrange them he gave a mass of special information on this subject and explained that in advising the suliots to retire to their mountains he had really only put them in a false position as long as he retained possession of the fort of kiafa which is the key of the selieda the serasquier replied in a friendly manner ordered the military salute to be returned in ali's honor shot for shot and forbade that henceforth a person of the valor and intrepidity of the lion of tepelin should be described by the epithet of excommunicated he also spoke of him by his title of vizier which he declared he had never fortified the right to use and he also stated that he had only entered epirus as a peacemaker kurshid's emissaries had just seized some letters sent by prince alexander ypsilanti to the greek captains at epirus without going into details of the events which led to the greek insurrection the prince advised the polemarchs chiefs of the Seliad, to aid ali pasha in his revolt against the port but to so arrange matters that they could easily detach themselves again their only aim being to seize his treasures which might be used to procure the freedom of greece By these letters a messenger from kurshid delivered to ali they produced such an impression upon his mind that he secretly resolved only to make use of the greeks and to sacrifice them to his own designs if he could not inflict a terrible vengeance on their perfidy 
He heard from the messenger at the same time of the agitation in European Turkey, the hopes of the Christians, and the apprehension of a rupture between the port and Russia. It was necessary to lay aside vain resentment and to unite against these threatening dangers. Kurshid Pasha was, said his messenger, ready to consider favorably any propositions likely to lead to a prompt pacification, and would value such a result far more highly than the glory of subduing by means of the imposing force at his command a valiant prince, whom he had always regarded as one of the strongest bulwarks of the Ottoman Empire. This information produced a different effect upon Ali to that intended by the Srasquier. Passing suddenly from the depths of despondency to the height of pride, he imagined that these overtures of reconciliation were only a proof of the inability of his foes to subdue him, and he sent the following propositions to Kurshid Pasha. If the first duty of a prince is to do justice, and that of his subjects is to remain faithful and obey him in all things, from this principle we derive that of rewards and punishments, and although my services might sufficiently justify my conduct to all time, I nevertheless acknowledge that I have deserved the wrath of the sultan, since he has raised the arm of his anger against the head of his slave. Having humbly implored his pardon, I fear not to invoke his severity towards those who have abused his confidence. With this object I offer, first, to pay the expenses of the war, and the tribute and arrears due from my government without delay. Secondly, as it is important for the sake of example that the treason of an inferior towards his superior should receive fitting chastisement, I demand that Pasho Bey, formerly in my service, should be beheaded, he being the real rebel and the cause of the public calamities which are afflicting the faithful of Islam. Thirdly, I require that for the rest of my life I shall retain without annual reinvestiture my Pashalik of Yanina, the coast of Epirus, a Carnania and its dependencies subject to the rights, charges, and tribute due now and hereafter to the Sultan. Fourthly, I demand amnesty and oblivion of the past for all those who have served me until now, and if these conditions are not accepted without modifications, I am prepared to defend myself to the last. Given at the castle of Yanina, March 7th, 1821. End of chapter 9. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.